Hi everyone, I am Jennifer Hancock. This is Teaching Teachers to Teach Values for the International Humanistic Management Association. This is the last of our series. We have several videos on our website at humanisticmanagement.international. Um, they are resources for uh, existing teachers, new teachers, and whoever wants to learn how to integrate values into the classroom effectively by having conversations with educators who do that so you can learn how they do it and take what works for you and ignore the stuff that doesn't. Our guest today is Kalai Mugalan. Mugalan. Uh, he's a human resources business consultant, an associate professor, a program director, an emotional intelligence trainer. He does diversity trainer. He's a geek. He's a weirdo. He loves life. He's a dad. Um, he's done sessions all over the world, Malaysia, Ghana, and he's a humanist. And that's how I met him. Welcome, Kalai. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. So um, what we'd like you to do is spend about 15 minutes giving us your, you know, if you had to give someone like three things or three or four things that they should do in the classroom to teach teachers how you do it, like what are the pieces of advice you give people? And let's go from there. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, I'm an, an assistant professor, not an associate. <laughs> but nevertheless, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry for the time mess up. So I'm glad you're here. Um, so <clears throat> here it goes. So when Jennifer asked me to do this, so, and I know all of you know something, the idea around our last lecture when, when the lecturers, that's the very last lecture we give. I actually do one in all my classes to my students uh, in every one of my classes. Uh, but I looked at this as if, if I was giving a last lecture to my fellow instructors, right? Last lecture to the lecturer what would my piece be? And I do a bunch of things in class. What would be all my little dirty secrets that I use? Um, so I'll share that with you um, and I'll show it everything you need to know. It's not a secret, it's a little strategy. Uh, I think anybody can do this. I know all of you have your own techniques. I hope to maybe enhance your technique or maybe your technique gets a little better. So I usually get, uh, start every one of my meetings. This is my strategy number one, okay? Um, so that I will go off with the feelings check. I let everybody in class, if it's a large class, I'll pair people up. And then I have a sheet that has all the words that denote emotions. I give it out to everybody and they start off and I will always demo it. So in my class, even before my presentation, um, Jennifer helped me calm down by chit-chatting uh, to, to this tone of voice. I'll be a little bit higher, right? Um, so I would go in and I'll say something like this, like, what am I feeling? I'll say, I'm feeling excited. It's a rainy morning. I'm a little nervous. I'm hoping to give something to my fellow lecturers. So that's where I am, okay? And then I'll usually go around at everybody. If it's a small group, everybody gets a minute or two. Um, the feelings check is kind of weird. You don't want anybody to run off explaining why they're feeling what they're feeling. And so as the instructor, I'm like, you know, I, I hear you is what I say, and then let them say it. Um, I've been made fun of over the years when I've done it, but I've, over time, people have asked me, board meetings, CEOs have come back and said, do you have that list with you? Can I have it? Um, students will come up to me and say, I need to do feelings check. They'll come in and blah, 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 and then they're done. Uh, my classic example why this is pretty powerful is I had a student come in who apparently police had stopped her. She had run a red light and she comes in and she's mad, angry. She just spurts out all the words and then she's done. And then now I have her back in my class. So that's one of my strategies called, I call it feelings check. Literally a little tool. It's a little sheet of paper. I give it out to everybody and I do that. Um, there's the other piece that I before I get into the classes, this is the very first day of class and I do it in every class, all right? And then as I begin my class within my uh, syllabus, I have this um, uh, learner-centered model list. It's in like if in the sheets of paper, you'll see it, that I am not the boss anymore. I'm not, I'm simply a facilitator. And, you know, if you go back in time with the Harari and, uh, Michio Kaku, they all say we have to teach students 
how to learn. We cannot teach knowledge so much anymore because knowledge is in the cell phone, right? So I pick a few pieces of words that is incredibly important knowledge base. Other than that, I am teaching how to learn. I'm paying attention how my students are learning and where they are falling apart and what's in their way, uh, what's, what emotions come up. Emotion, learning is emotional. If I'm not paying attention to the emotion, I would have done my job. Only the ones that was calm and relaxed around me would have learned the most. And happy people learn the best. So I'm paying attention to a lot of my emotions. That's where the feelings check come. To justify what I do, I use the learner-centered model. It's uh, lots of research has been done. It helps me justify. I occasionally use, I'm pretty sure all of you have seen it, Ken Robinson, Changing Education Paradigm. I show that video too, like times have changed. Um, how do I teach learning? All right. And then, so a couple of techniques there. And then I, in my introduction, I show my, um, my students, uh, me, not the academic me, me. So in my introduction, I see now you got my degrees and all of that, but I'm primarily, uh, like I said, I'm a weirdo. I am a little brown man. I love to dance. I have a, di have a diploma in dance. I was, and I have two kids and I will show pictures of my children in class. And then the joke I have, uh, you know, is I have one wife and two kids and they just were like, what is he talking about? So my introduction is very, 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 very as personal as it can, that I'm okay with. So I'm not saying everybody should get as personal as I do. I do think the more a student sees me as this human being, not this person in this box in a classroom, they see me as a human being, uh, I have greater access, they, they allow themselves to access me. Um, so, so I, 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 so in my introduction, I say all of this. I also include this one particular question. I ask things like, "What are you about?" Um, students respond in different, diff, uh, in different groups of different. What am I trying to say? Different. I teach in Alabama, so I have to speak a little Alabamese if that Alabamese makes sense. What are you about? People seem to know what that means. Uh, and then they will tell me a lot of things when I ask them, what are you about? That's a weird Southern question that you can use. I also add in my introduction, I give them a list to answer, right? Other than your name, what does your name mean to you? Who gave you your name? Uh, how would you like to be called? And I take notes this time because I'm not gonna remember all of it. Uh, and then I will mess up and I'll tell them, I will promise I will screw up. I promise I'll screw up. Will you still hang on to me? Work with me. Um, and then this weird question, something about you, unless you told me, I'll never know. Unless you told me, you'll never know. And then I will open up that like uh, my homeless, I talk about that. I talk about my dad, you know, struggling with alcohol. Uh, and people are like, wow. So I have dismantled me as the human. Uh, like I am accessible. I am not this special dude with special powers. Although I mess with that sometimes as well, that I do have special powers. Uh, uh, so this introduction is, I spend a little bit extra time on my first day of class uh, just because of that. I am breaking down all the labels and all the things that put on me that, that I'm possibly guessing, of course, to take them out, like, look, behind all of that armor or whatever you see behind my tie, behind my accent, behind my degree, there is this human being that's in there trying to do life just like them. Um, that, those are big pieces that I do. Um, other than introduction, as the classes begin and I start doing, I only do feelings checks. Sometimes I take a minute when a student talks about um, overwhelmed, and uh, I'm like, tell me more about what is overwhelmed. Uh, when they say I'm sad, I think, would you tell me a little bit more about being sad? What does that sadness mean to you? Quite often, they're not as dramatic as I have thought of. They simply say it. Um, 
as the time goes by along the way, when I think I have access to them, when they're like, yeah, you're still full of it, right? I'm running my mouth and like, yeah, you talk about all this. Um, I do a couple of things. One is to get them to think about some basic words and its meaning. It's a little bit of epistemology. I teach them how to do epistemology to simple words, very, very, very simple words. Um, like for, for instance, if the definition of sex, because they're kids, right? They're college kids, they'll all get excited. You think you know, can somebody here define it? And no matter what they say, I give them an alternate possibility and they're like, hmm. I didn't know. In fact, even as a society, we don't know what sex is. We call uh, intercourse, gender, sex as well, right? We use the same word for so many things and we confuse a lot of things with it. Um, along with the epistemology, uh, you can pick other words. I have asked students, can somebody here, we think we know race, what is race? And people will attempt to define it and you will fall apart because it just, it's a social construction of our reality. That's a couple of epistemological words that do race and sex, the two biggest thing that we use to judge each other, right? You can take it apart. So that helps me when I teach values, when I teach a little bits and pieces of knowledge to like take that word apart and put it in context. That's another strategy I use. And, and to get them to see we are students and we are in a learning place, there are two other strategies I use. Uh, one is, um, I've like in the list, it's the outrageous claims. I call them 50 outrageous claims. Things like, um, if you look up where the, the Barbie doll came from, or crime has gone down last 30 years, um, there's a whole bunch of little things that a mobile Alabama has a law that you cannot wear high heels. They love that. So things that we think we know, right? When you look up data, it just doesn't fit. Like divorce has gone down last 30 years. It just doesn't fit. And then until you look it up and then you come back and you go, oh, what I thought I know about what the world is, it's not exactly fitting. Um, so I use that as, as a tool. Um, and then finally, I also do, they've done research on how little we know about our own county and our own state. Most of us do not know the population of our state, let alone our county. So there's a little list uh, of uh, who lives in your county. Uh, the study was done in England. So I have kind of taken it down to the students to, they come back and they say, I had no idea. I actually, um, I also live in Nashville, Tennessee in Williamson County. Most of my students will, the jaw will drop because Williamson County is the seventh richest county in the country. And I'm like, ah, that makes sense why I see so many, there's a Tesla uh, show house in the state. So all this is to break down their mental Breakdown sounds really weird, right? So as an instructor, I'm getting them to open up their little whatever they think they know to think about. As a humanist, very often in the end, I do my last lecture, questions will ask, so what are you? That question always comes up, what are you? I guess in Alabama, they wanna know my about my race and ethnicity, and they also wanna know what's my religion. That will often come up. Um, I often say I'm a little brown man, and people laugh and then I say, well, I grew up 28 years in Alabama. Does that make me an Alabamian? And I will often ask, you know, I, I was born in Malaysia. Does that make me a Malaysian? My roots two, three, gen five generations ago goes back to India. Does that make me an Indian? Um, they, a little more epistemology, everybody goes, I don't know what's happening in this class. Um, so I use this to every one of my classes. I teach healthcare management. Uh, sociology is the easiest. I milk it in my sociology class. But primarily, I teach healthcare management, uh, masters uh, and undergrad. And they have to go through this with me um, very early on. I do not teach knowledge. I'll tell you again. I will give them knowledge. I give them, like, we have to learn how to learn. And to learn how to learn, we have to think about what we think we know already. That's the premise. Um, 
something came up that I get my students to do. If they struggle in math, I, be, I will stop the class and do a little bit of math. And there's one other strategy that I use. I forgot to write it down, but it just came up. And that is during a final, during my exams, uh, no notes, no phone, but they're allowed to talk to each other. And when I teach sociology, you can look up the definition of sociology and I tell them, I don't, everybody can look up what sociology is. What I want you to tell me is why study sociology? Why study healthcare management? Let's stick to sociology, right? It's like, why study sociology? What's the value of sociology? Why do we even study sociology? That's what I want you to have, not the definition of sociology. So if you tell me the rest of it, that's where you score a lot of points. But the definition, talk amongst yourselves, you'll figure it out. And my students, I've been criticized for it and I've come back and I said, hey, uh, pick any one of your weakest, whatever you think is the weakest student, ask them any definition in my exam. They may not know the answer, but they'll probably give you a little discussion on it. And for me, that's a success. All right, I think I've passed 15 minutes. Those are the few things that I do, and I'm glad the things that I forgot came up. Um, so I'm open for questions and whatever not. All right, sure. Jennifer, back at you. Thank you. Um, so if you have any questions for Kalai, please put them in the chat room. Um, and I want to kind of start with some of the things you brought up for me. Uh, you know, most of the people on this group are going to be uh, business teachers, and you did mention that you you do this in um, healthcare management. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that works, because you know I understand the concept that building trust makes conversations when you bring up the epistemology of say what does love mean in a management setting, mm -hmm. right? Um, the practice of having these epistemi epistemological conversations um, makes it a lot easier, I would think, They're, the, the students are ready to have that conversation because you've been introducing this technique all along so that when you get to whatever it is, you could do that with a value word, right? Um, but if you could talk a little bit about the experience of how management students respond to this when you do start bringing in the values? So unless I can manage myself, it sounds going to sound so cliche, right? Unless I have a pretty good management of self, I'm not going to be successfully do it with anybody else. So there's some self-management, self-awareness that one must have as a manager to be able to successfully, I think a, an instructor is a manager he or she is a class manager. They manage the class. Um, so the same tools apply. I don't want to call it mentorship. I have a lot more power in the classroom. Uh, managers, I presumably have a lot more power. And, and to actually have these discussions if they are in a work setting. I have had this question asked before in a dentist setting. Uh, and I simply said, whatever word you're trying to communicate after saying it and to ask the other person, what did you hear? Right, because our words messes up. What did you hear? And the reverse of it is what I wish you knew. So it's like the simple instructions. I need you, I need you not to come in late, right? And to say, okay, what did you hear? Uh, 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 a worker might say, I am scared, I'm feeling punished, I'm being picked on. And then say, that's not what I'm doing. I just need you to come in and clock in at the right time. Because of, I have to answer to my manager and how do I explain this, right? And I, you're a good worker, I want you to keep coming. I don't want, you know, there are repercussions to somebody who comes in regularly. So it changes the conversation. I do this with my wife. What do you want me to know? I hear you saying a lot of things. What do you want me to know? And she'll huff and puff and say, no, I just need to vent. Or I need you to know that garbage bag when it's full and, and my thing, it's half quarter way full, pack it, throw it away. So that's, <laughs> it's a little management piece on my, uh, for, for students to think about, you have to self-manage. And you have to think about the words you use to communicate may not be the words what other people hear. So to make sure 
in, especially in human resource, ask them to tell you what did you hear, and then you can fix it. So the first question we have is from Bob. He says, how do you relate values and ethics with ethics in your classes? And do, do you view them as being the same thing? Sort of. I do it in the very, so the, the beginning, they see the humanity, the human in me. At the very end of the class, you know, I will tell them very openly. I, uh, there's a small other lecture that I use that everyone is beautiful because if we've all met somebody who is just so beautiful until they open their mouth. We've all met somebody so ugly until they open their mouth, it shifts. I spent a little time that every one of you is brilliant. These are my values that I think every human being is brilliant. You've come this far and I'm going to hold you to it that you are incredibly brilliant. Um, and then the other one is every one of you belong. So those are my specific values I bring up in the beginning of the class, I spent a little time, I'll be happy to share that piece with you, um, that these are my personal values. And in the end of it, I bring my beautiful, belong, brilliant, and then I talk about forgiveness, gratitude, and hope, what those three things do to me. I call them my value. I call them my, uh, I, I don't put it, my value and how it helps me think about other human beings not as my colleagues, my workers, but other human beings. And hopefully we'll do the right thing. Doing the right thing is what I think is ethics and doing the right thing by who, the most people I include, the better ethical decisions I make. And how do the students respond to that? I mean, do they, do they start owning it and practicing it well as well? Because obviously you're describing a modeling technique where you're being explicit about what you value and how you will act based on those values. It, do the students take that up and like, <laughs> how does that impact the dynamics in the classroom? I'm just kind of curious. It's brilliant. They cry. It's not unusual. I take tissue paper to class. Uh, they're like, thank you for noticing. Uh, um, I think uh, I've been teaching for 16 years now. I continue to have relationships with my past students. In my quote unquote last lecture, I do tell them, if you want to stay in touch with me, it's up to you. I can write great recommendation letters. If we have made a connection in this class, I don't have to remember you, I will remember you. And I continue to have students stay in touch with me. Um, my bad experiences had been perhaps students with uh, mental health issues uh, that I, because I'm so open and they come like, give me what I need to know. Let me do the test and get out of here. Those students who are very hung up on the old model, they struggle the most. Uh, in general, I, the reason I keep doing it, in my evaluation, I ask my students, uh, tell me what you learned. Like in my final exam, tell me what you personally got out of this class. Anything I should do and keep doing and not do because it didn't go well for you. So in 16 years, very, very little, oh, you suck. They walk away saying you're weird, you're different, it's good. And, you know, they're saying, you know, it didn't do me, but you keep doing what you're doing. So that's been the general feedback. So I've got another question and it's kind of related to this, but it came up, but several people asked it in the sign up and it has to do with, you know, these, these experiences that you're, because so everybody else knows I've, you know, seen Kali in action and it's very experiential and um, very emotional at times. And so I'm wondering, the question is, everybody's moved to Zoom. There's all this online learning going on. How do we do this with asynchronous or, you know, there, there's two types of online learning, right? The asynchronous where they're watching it. Half of the people are going to watch this video. So how do we do this when we're online? And then also, is it doable using an asynchronous method? I'm not sure about the asynchronous because they see it, hear it, and then come back. And uh, I've not done an asynchronous class. 
in, in uh, the even I've not done a pure online class that's been I'm expecting them to read in my remote learning classes, my hybrid classes in situations like this. I didn't think it would work when the COVID-19 began, but as I have begun doing it, it seemed to be pretty effective. So I have high attendance. That's one study we did. If we did feelings check without feelings check, what is the attendance rate? And I got a whole bunch of instructors to do it. And doing just the feelings check increases attendance. Um, so, which is like, okay, so there's something going on there. And I, you know, students have occasions, so oh, your class is therapy. I'm like, no, it might be therapeutic for you, but it's, I don't do therapy. This is not therapy. I am seeing you as a human being. Um, and uh, so that's where you, you might want to come to class. So in a, I'm not sure about online. I don't know how that works. I don't like it because this doesn't happen. They don't get to see me. Um, the asynchronous, if they read it, like, you know, I would love to talk to Ken Robinson about that little video he made, right? Um, to, if, if that's an opportunity, um, sure. Uh, I'm not convinced it's as effective as where I can do one-on-one, -on -one, not one-on-one, -on -one, in, a, in a place where they get to see the tone of voice, right? Our tone of voice is amazing. Um, so unless you're aware of it, we can screw up pretty easily. Um, we become incredibly aware at a funeral, but we forget about it every other time. Um, so it needs to be incredibly on the point to be thinking about what our tone of voice and what's the tone of voice you want to communicate, right? I'm like this and I become aware, like, where is my tone today? And I talk to my children, where is my tone today? It's a habit I had to develop because we do not think about it, but we do think about it when we go to funeral we will immediately get solemn and it'll, it'll be communicated through our tone. So that's the summary, you know, that a couple of very intricate things gets missed out in asynchronous, uh, a couple of things uh, online. I don't think this can happen, uh, but if there is a face-to-face -face at all, uh, even through Zoom or some kind of go-to meeting or something, um, it's been my experience since March that it works. So I'm becoming more and more confident doing it that it works. So I guess the next question I have is, you know, I've been in Zoom meetings where, you know, I'm having a great day, <laughs> in a really good mood, but someone else is going through something really, really horrible. And, you know, you want to be present for this person and change your tone. But at the same time, you know, if you're moderating sessions, you also have to keep moving and keep 100%, you want as many people as you can engaged in the conversation. So how do you, when you're doing these feelings checks, I would imagine some stuff comes up. People will admit to some really bad things happening. Um, how do you continue teaching a class if someone just said my dad died? Or do so, you? <laughs> I, I do, I do, I do, I do. Plus, you know, uh, I have had more, you know, close person who has suicide, right? The class basically stops for many, for more than a minute, right? I said, ouch. And let them think about it. Thank them for coming to class anyways. I get them tissue paper. Here's the craziest thing I've done in a, in a class around feeling check, right? A student says, I'm, I occasionally have panic attacks. Uh, and uh, I will actually go over to them. Anytime it comes up, let me know, I'll have one. Have a panic attack, I'll make sure you don't get hurt. Almost always, it has never happened over my 16 years. They will go, oh, really? Um, in, the, in that case, I let them process. I ask for who passed, what is their names? Let them process, just ask questions. The class will want you to stop. If you pretended it didn't happen and you went on, everybody else is watching. Like, what kind of a teacher are you? And, and you know, the knowledge piece is here's the me word, here's the meaning of it, right? That's so easy to communicate, right? What you do with it is what matters. So if, if eventually there are a couple of words that I think are incredibly important that I didn't have enough time, right? I just give it to him. He's the knowledge, take it. 
right? And, and talk a little bit about it, but I want them to learn to learn. So here I have stopped. And then uh, the last one, I had a student who did have a suicide, her uh, husband's brother committed suicide. So I had to let her process it and everybody else just waited like, and then they're all thankful that I did that. And at one point he said, my husband is breaking down and then I need to go. And I said, yes, you do. And then I very quickly remember the things I did for you. I just sat with you. I didn't say anything at all. I just let you have your emotion. You know, don't calm him down. Don't get him out of it. Let, let him stay there for a minute. He'll know when to come out. And then these students will come back at me. What did I miss? If they missed a class, what did I miss? I have the most uh, engaged student at that moment because I was willing to sit with them. Um, quite often what comes up is, you know, the, the, the work situations come up and that's rough. Death comes up a lot. Um, and I just literally stop the class, let them process a little bit. It doesn't take but 10, 15 minutes. You would think it takes the whole class, it doesn't. If you visited your friend at a, uh, at a home at somebody's death, usually they cry for a few minutes and then they talk a little bit and then they're done. They wanna talk about something else. I've not seen it go more than five, 10 minutes. I, usually it's I am the one dragging it out a little bit. They're like, I'm, I'm good, let's do class. I'm like, no, no, talk a little bit more. We have time, I'll figure this out. So that is what has happened when it comes to death. Suicide is something I see a lot. Mm. So I was wondering, um, you know, because one of the practices we've tried to have within the, the Humanistic Management Association group, and Michael's on right now, um, is that we want to be fully human with one another, that as an organization, as we're having our meetings, you know, stuff happens, people get divorced, and they're still trying to volunteer with the association and still continue on with their lives. Right. Um, and I think the advice you had for these, for how these conversations can take place, while still allowing the person to participate and not just sitting on that, but also creating space for it at the same time. I think it's, it's it really helpful, because part of what we're committed to as an organization is to bring our whole selves, the good, the bad, and the, the, the ugly at times, hopefully not ugly too often, but you know, it's there. So the next question we have is Bob said, he finds it interesting. So that Jennifer, you one second, let me, yeah. let me, I can perhaps add on to that, that little piece that if that strategy is freaky. So there is a couple of, uh, uh, I'll send it to Jennifer so we can post it. So I, at a funeral, we do not advise. So do not advise what to do, right? We don't overhug, underhug. We give them enough space. So if you create, you don't bring it up at a funeral, do we? We don't, we just don't. We practice the same thing here. So in, in a management world, they love it that you don't have to advise because it's liability, right? So I, no advice, don't bring it up. That's confidentiality like we do for funerals and give them permission to feel, tell, ask them the story behind the tears. So it's a little set of questions you can simply ask and they will go through, you can go through each one of those questions and they will do it. And then they themselves will call it up. If they don't call it up, the other strategy I use is, you know, in a work setting, if not in a classroom, is a timer. I simply said, look like, looks like you have some emotions, some feelings. I'm gonna give you 10 minutes. And, and let you have it. And it, I'm not gonna talk about me. Don't ever bring up your story. Don't ever say, yeah, I know your mother died, but my mom and dad died. We don't do that at a funeral either. We simply go to the sorrow and stay with them. And I simply go, and when the timer goes off, I said, okay, hang in there. If you need to talk some more, come back. And, and I'm done and I'm completely done. I can add on, I'll write down and, and, and list off questions and strategies on how to listen to the emotion if things get deep. Perfect. So Bob said, and we'll include that in the, as one of the documents yes. on the website. Yes, um, so Bob says he finds it interesting that you self-describe as weird. Is that a euphemism for something more specific, i.e. funny, sarcastic, or thought-provoking, or a combination of actions and relationships? 
or is it just a typical response from daughters to their fathers as in you're weird? <laughs> Thanks, Bob. All of it. <laughs> so, um, so here's the question, right? I've been to conferences and workshops when, in, in when I've learned the tools of emotions, right? One of the questions they ask, how many of you have felt crazy? Right? And most of you are thinking like, yeah, or are connected to somebody who you think might not be all there. How many of us have struggled wondering, maybe I'm not all there all the time. And it's a common feeling, it's a human feeling to feel like, how do I fit in? In this normal curve of society, where do I fit in? You know, what is normal anyways? None of us can define it. So there is a sense of like, right, in our, and all students, it's my world, when I say that, quite often I'll have a few students say, me too. Uh, that's the reason uh, I do it. That's another tricky, fun thing that I do is I introduce myself, I'm the little brown man, and there's a little laughter. And in the strategy behind the little brown man is to, I'm comfortable around talking about race. And uh, so people laugh and then they know I, they don't have to be super nervous around me, around race, because I'm open to chatting about it. So that's the weird part. And if, uh, if I have time and I'm in a logic, especially in my sociology group, Jennifer's heard this, I go in and I say, hi everybody, I'm a little brown man and I'm not a terrorist. And there'll be bust out laughter. And then I'm like, and then, okay, so now we got that out of the way, let's do the third one. I'm also, however, I am a racist, I'm a sexist, I'm a smellist, I'm a lookist, I'm a shoeist, I'm a carist, I'm a hair colorist, I'm a hair texturist, I'm a skin tonist, uh, name it if society has it. I have it. I'm also a family is. My family comes first. I am biased towards my family. No matter how bad they are to me, I will stand by them. They oh. And then when the word weird, like, yeah, you're weird. And so it breaks a lot of the social norms and social ideas, how we have grouped ourselves, especially in the US. These jokes won't has not worked in Ghana, nor has it worked in Malaysia. Uh, so, so it happens to work really well in the United States when I say these jokes. It's like, takes apart all the little fuzziness we have to where they can see me. So and that brings me to one, a couple of the questions that we got um, in the, the, the sign up form is the multi, you know, teaching values in a multicultural setting and teaching emotional intelligence in a multicultural setting. Um, different cultures respond to this differently. You're obviously in the US South, uh, which is very different from say <laughs> New York City or That's Los right. Angeles, or even, you know, South Florida, right? Um, and then that's going to be different, like you said, than from being if you're in Ghana or you're in Malaysia or you're in China or you're in Europe. All of these places respond to values differently, um, but they all and comfort talking about values, but they're also huge differences in how comfortable people can be about talking about their emotions, which are tied to value conversations, right? So um, how do you navigate that? So this is where the tone of voice comes into play. I think it's been my belief that, that my tone of voice, when I did it in Ghana, they gave me like the entire department, like all the students and the faculty, that's a lot of people. And, and the things I talked about uh, was the tone of voice. I want you to see me as a human, not this, not that, not this. What will it take for you to see me as a human? It's, and, and I don't even answer the question. And, and it's been my experience, our emotions are the same. Our emotional juxtaposition to human beings are the same. Uh, no, you know, I think therefore I am, I don't think that's accurate. I feel therefore I am, is a lot more accurate than I think therefore I am. Uh, while we aspire to be the thinking person, 
my cross-cultural pieces, like especially in, in Alabama, when they see me, I, you won't find too many people looking like me. Um, I've been able to access like I am human. And that's been really, 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 in fact, in the end, if they ask me, what's your religion? That comes up a lot in Alabama. Where do you go to church? And, and, and I say, I'm a humanist. I'm sorry to let you down. I'm actually a humanist. And, and then that takes into another conversation. I, in my introduction, somewhere in there, if I can put it in there, I do in Alabama, I don't, because humanists are antichrist in Alabama. Uh, so I avoid that position. But I've been reasonably successful. My I'm a terrorist joke doesn't work. Uh, but I'm a racist, sexist, nationalist, and all of that. That works. Um, I'm a weird person works in all over the place because I think all of us uh, feel a little bit crazy. Wonder if we are normal completely. I don't think anybody feels they're completely normal. Um, so there's a little bit of question mark in our head and then me accessing that question mark and say, it's okay to be that. It's okay to think outside the box. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be whatever. So I guess the question is, let's kind of move over to the teaching of values. Um, and the question was, you know, has anything changed in the way students may want to learn values? Um, you know, and can you speak to that? You, 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 you've, you've humanized yourself, you're modeling um, the, you're modeling your values and acting on your values. Um, right. But do you get to a point where you're having conversations about values and are the students willing to go there with you? And can you speak to that? So Alabama, right? Mostly in Alabama. When I was te te teaching in Tennessee, students tend to want to go there. In Alabama, they oftentimes peg my values to my religion. And when I let them down to some extent that I'm not, I'm a humanist, right? It, it's irrelevant to me what your belief system is around how we gather our values. Um, these are my values, you know, and, and I think these are generally human values. It's not pegged on religious values. Um, it gets tense, like you can even change my, notice my tone of voice now. I started speaking slowly because it gets a little bit of difficulty. But however, when I tell them my values that every one of us is brilliant, right? My values that every one of you is beautiful beyond measure. That every one of us belong, whether you like it or not, just like the trees and the birds. We belong, this earth is ours, it's mine. I don't need permission. Those values, they're like, oh, it's like blows them off, like, wow. And those articulation of those values uh, often always takes them to religion. And, and that's, it kind of gets awkward a little bit. I lose a few, but I've kept a few. Um, I had a choir in school. They be sang Christmas songs and the school is fine with it. This is Montgomery, Alabama, for those who don't know, that's where I teach. Um, but I also have students like, yeah, I, I do, I'm a cultural Christian, that comes up. Um, a lot of people are cultural Christians. They don't necessarily buy all the value systems. Sure, we had a question from Jamie, it says, help us understand your joke that you are a racist, sexist, nationalist, hair colorist, skin tonist, et cetera. They're not quite sure what to make of this or how others would interpret it. So I keep going, right? I'll look around, I'm at dresses, I'm, I, that I am, so the last one, as many as I can do, the very last one is I'm a family is. The, it is the owning that we're all biased. Biasness is um, uh, blind. We're all blind to our biasness, that we all have it. And when I, in fact, the follow-up of that is when I commit the mistake of being biased to you by my language, my choice of words, right? Please catch me so I can fix it. So that's how that the whole thing ends. 
please catch me when I can say in sociology, I say, if you catch it, you get a point. Do it to your final exam. And you and, and I and I'll tell them, I promise you I'll do it because I'm straight, I'm male, I've got some power and authority, and I am going to use some words that will exclude some group out there that I'm not aware of. Right? And then you will notice that my my reference always comes out as a he. Doesn't have to be. And if you pick it up, you'll get a point and I'll get to apologize and fix it. That's the structure behind saying all of those craziness. I look around, things that I have a liking for is how I pick, right? Nice cars, nice hair, nice whatever is my biasness. And to call it as a bias, and, and, and when I describe that I'm a family, yes, the little statement I use, right? I, my family comes first, even when they screw up, I'll be on their side. And a lot of us are sportists that you love your sports team, even when they lose again and again and again, you're gonna jump into it and support them. And, and, and then that's human, but we don't want it, we have it. How it's, it's in my way from connecting to you, please catch me on it. That's the framework for that. Thanks for asking for that clarification. That is the framework, the whole framework. I just gave a little bit because I thought at 15, but this is wonderful. I just want to thank you for uh, for explaining that because it's something that I'm uh, struggling with as uh, as someone whose intersectionality is in the majority, other than the fact that I'm female. Um, it, it, I'm I'm struggling with that, so I really love that answer. Thank you for sharing that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, we have other questions um, that have to do with um, how do you do this without patronizing your pupils? I don't know how to answer that. I feel like I'm exposing me when I do all of this. I don't see this as patronizing. I'm exposing me, uh, bringing myself from instructor student to bringing it down to, to as, as where I can. I do remind them I have more power than you. I give grades, right? However, I remind them also, look, if I say something that is, uh, that is inappropriate, for instance, if I ever use the word stupid on any one of you, you will get my butt fired within the day. Today with cell phone, you can just record me and get me fired. So I do not see this as patronizing at all. I'm, I'm a little bitty man, five feet four. Uh, and running around making human contact in order for them to think, to like, look, we have to do it. Now, a lot of my strength comes from that I do this own work myself, right? I am, I am going to be compassionate to the extent I'm compassionate to myself. So I give myself permission to totally, if I can use the word fuck up, and then forgive myself for it. Like, yeah, we all do. And I've done it, I've done it. Like I have said things, like there was once I'll tell you, a student's house burned down, <laughs> right? So he's sharing that to me in class. My very first, first thing was, um, is there anything the school or I or the class can do to help you? Uh, you know, I'm thinking he's a, he's a black boy, African-American. And so I'm thinking, okay, oh my God, he's probably whatever, all my isms have kicked in, right? And uh, I said, can anything, and he's like, nope. The house was insured, everything was insured. We are better off than we were before. And then I'm like, I'm embarrassed. And I literally did that, I'm embarrassed. I'm so sorry and I'm so happy. So I'm quick to apologize. You, you can imagine that me, when I screw up and say things because I'm straight, I'm, I'm, in, I'm immigrant, uh, I'm, uh, whatever that, that's laid on me that I live in my majority blindness that I wear, that when I step out, I'd like to be told. And I very, very quickly apologize and then move on. I have, so a, a lot, pretty much this whole conversation has been about emotional intelligence and helping students you know, 
modeling emotional intelligence, but also helping your students with emotional intelligence. Do you see that translating into more ethical behavior um, and also uh, ethical understandings of whatever the topic is you're teaching? I believe it. I don't even see it. I, and I'll tell you why I think I believe it. Um, because our, when you're aware of your values and then you're a lot more awake to yourself, you're, you're able to see it in others, then my decision-making is not solo. It's not out of fear. It's not out of desperation. It's not out of fear that, oh my God, what if I would do the wrong thing? There is some level of, you know, it may not be the right decision or the wrong decision. It's perhaps almost always the best decision. We're all doing the best we know how at all times. So when I talk about forgiveness, that comes up. That we're all doing the best we know how at all times, given the resources available to us at that time. And, and in Alabama, we say, you know, they don't know no better, right? We don't know no better. And then I often say, that's what Nelson Mandela said. And that's what Gandhi said. And, and I like to say it in those terms. So in order to, when our decisions comes to ethical ethics and our decision needed to be around ethics, then your commerce around you, you're not making a decision based on out of all sorts of emotions. You're less influenced by emotions. The piece behind the EI, emotional intelligence is feel what you need to feel so you can think again. When you are thinking, then you're making the best of decision. Perhaps the best of decision is the most ethical of decisions. Um, so that's that's why I truly think they're all interconnected. Uh, EI, ethics, humanism, they're all closely connected to each other. And for me, at least, that's how I've woven it. Okay. Um, the, the, the next question has to do with um, age differences and experiences in the students. I know we have people who participate in these sessions who are working with young kids, middle schoolers and high schoolers. You're obviously teaching in the college situation. You've also done programs for companies. So it, how do these strategies work for these various age groups and, and, and do they, and what kind of modifications might need to be made based on age and experience? I have a 10 year old and a 13 year old. That's a group I don't touch. I, I don't know what to do with them. I, I absolutely don't know what to do with them because you're processing everything under any, without any rubrics. I don't think they're still learning our society's rubrics. I truly don't know what to, I admire teachers who do magic, you know, the great school teachers. I, I, I give up. I don't touch that at all. Um, in the adult piece, uh, it's been a little bit easier. In work settings, if they are, if the participants are forced to be there, there is always a distancing. Like, oh, you're full of it, and and I acknowledge that. To even in my classes when if it's a very large class, like 36 students in it, you'll have a few that's like, you are full of it. And I own that. Like, you know, for some of you, I'm going to come across as I am absolutely full of it. Uh, in fact, they will call it bullshit, right? And I said, to a large degree, that is what it is. But let me go to, I'm going to do what I'm doing. So I just own it. And I occasionally have somebody who come in and incredibly uncomfortable or sometimes they'll interrupt a lot. Um, those students or workers that I'll call them aside afterwards uh, and we'll ask them, what's in your way from noticing you from how smart you are? They'll go, what? And I'll repeat it. And I can type all these questions out for you. I literally use that question. What's in your way from noticing how smart you are? Like what? You obviously are incredibly smart. You have so much to say. That's, you know, uh, but what's in the way from you noticing it? You know, you generally don't wait on me. You interrupt to tell me what it is. 
So I'm just curious, like you are incredibly, incredibly smart. I see, I hear you, but what's in your way? And that's a weird question that they will stop being the interrupter in the class. And this usually happens in a work setting. Um, religious people has been the like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you didn't evoke uh, religiosity. But in work settings with younger group, it's been a smooth sail. It's been the smoothest sail and in when I have my college level students, simply because I have so much power. I'm the instructor, I can give grades. And I talk about that, right? And, and talk about their powers that if I say or do something that's inappropriate, you can record me and have me fired. Don't think that you have no power. Um, in a, of course, uh, in a work setting, I have won an interest to continue that relationship. Um, so it changes me a little bit. I don't go too deep unless they invite me to. I didn't go too deep here unless I'm invited to. So as the questions were asked, I went into it. I just touched the surfaces. All right, so we only have a few minutes left. Wow. Um, so I want you to kind of give us your parting, parting wisdom. You know, if, <laughs> so we, you know, teachers going out to teach for the first time, um, experienced teachers, what do you want them to walk away from this conversation with? What, what do you want to leave them with? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, I've been thinking about this, like from the time we spoke on doing this, like what is, if this is my last lecture, what is my last lecture? What we did is my last lecture, two lecturers. Um, the more we show of our humanity, whatever that humanity is, right? The more we show our humanity, we give permission to others to show their humanity. Um, whatever form it takes, it doesn't have to take the form I have taken, right? And I have learned how to do it. I can show people and share every one of my tools. But the more we show our humanity, not our professor, not the place of power, and to acknowledge it, the more we show our humanity um, that it's okay to not know because then in return, students show their humanity tell us where they are petrified with. They will tell us where they need, truly need help. They don't need help learning knowledge. Anybody can look it up. They need our human connection and support. And if, if the door is open, they will come and access us as needed. And in which I think we can touch most lives and, 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 and in, in return, you awaken learning in their, in their minds and their hearts. That'll be my parting thought. You Thank have forced you. me to think about what I do <laughs> in a totally different way. And I've loved it. Oh, good. Well, I, I really, I really appreciate you um, doing this for us because I know it was, it was different for you, uh, but I really appreciate it. Uh, for everybody watching, this was Teaching Teachers to Teach Values from the International Humanistic Management Association. Uh, the resources that Kalai has given us will be on the website with the video uh, and at our website, humanisticmanagement.international, and you can find it there for those of you who are watching this on the web. And thanks again, and check out our website, join. We have lots of programs that go on all the time.